I'm very excited to tell you our project that enables light communication, even if the light appears dark. This is a joint project with Professor Kevin Wright in the physics department and my advisor, Xia Zhou. There are a lot of interests in visible light communication, or we all see, where sitting LEDs work like wireless APs communicating with smart devices in the room. It uses the, the ubiquitous lights around us, offers much wider bandwidth, and has nice security properties. We believe it's the future of communication. But what happens when lights go out? You see, there are many scenarios where we don't want the light on, like in a sunny day or a dark night. You probably also don't want the flashlight on your phone to shine all the time. In all these scenarios, we'll see it won't work. Definitely not a good news for applications that require always on connectivity. So our question is, can we maintain the communication even if the light appears off? Now, you might be thinking about infrared communication. However, we will need to deploy infrared emitters everywhere. Also, high power infrared beams can cause thermal damage to our eyes, and they are hard to avoid because we can't see them. So what I want to tell you today is a technology we've developed which enables VLC to work even the light appears off using only LED bulb, no other emitters. We call it dark light. It's the dark side of VLC, where the force appears stronger. You can think of it as a special mode that LED lights can switch to when you don't need the light on. And here is a demo of how dark light works. The dark light transmitter is an off-the-shelf LED on the ceiling connected to a modulation unit. And the dark light receiver is a customized circuit board with a low-cost photodiode, connecting to a laptop displaying the received data in real time. Now, the light is off, but the communication is still going on. Now you might wonder how it works. Actually, the key idea is fairly simple. We encode data into very short light pulses at high frequency. As long as the LED duty cycle is low enough, meaning that the light pulses are sparse enough, our eyes can see them. But light sensors or photodiodes are much more sensitive, can see the light and decode the data. The idea sounds simple, but making it work is not easy. First of all, it's not trivial to generate ultra short and to generate and detect ultra short light pulses using off-the-shelf LED and low-cost uh, low cost photodiodes we need careful circuit design to drive the LED current fast and detect the light pulses at high rate. Second, encoding data into those very short sparse light pulses is challenging. We can easily end up with extremely low data rate. Also, the ambient light fluctuation can mess up with the decoding easily. Finally, when there are multiple dark light transmitters, the light pulses can interfere with one another and mess up with the decoding. And this is how we deal with them. First, let's take a closer look at the light pulses generated by off-the-shelf LED. We can see that it takes time for the LED to respond and rise, rises to its peak intensity. It's the LED's rise time. And it implies that in order to generate ultra-short light pulses, we need to drive the LED fast and make sure that the light pulses rise to a desirable light intensity in a short period, hundreds of nanoseconds in our prototype. Similarly, it also takes time for the photodiode to respond to the incoming light. If the photodiode responds too slowly, it won't detect anything. And if the receiver gain is too low, the received signal strength would be too weak, resulting in a very short communication range. A desirable receiver should respond fast with a high gain. And this is how we address all these challenges. At the transmitter side, in addition to a common MOSFET switching on and off the LED, 
we add a gate driver to speed up the switching and minimize the impact of LED's rise time. And at the receiver, we use a trans impedance amplifier, which ensures that the photodiode responds fast and amplifies the signal with a high gain. Then we sample the signal use a USRP for its high sampling rate, but we can easily replace the USRP with a low cost analog to digital converter to save energy. Now we have those pulses. The next question is how to encode data into them. It is tricky because simple modulation schemes like on-off keying or FSK end up with only 100, per second, uh, 100 bits per second as those light pulses are very sparse. So to solve this problem, we encode data into the position of the light pulse. Specifically, we divide the a symbol into multiple time slots and the appearance of a pulse can represent multiple bits. And you can see that the more time slots in a symbol, the more bits we can encode. So to maximize the encoding efficiency, we allow the time slot to be shorter than a light pass. And in the end, we have 1,024 slots in a symbol and 10 bits of data per symbol. This is how we encode data, the next is to decode data. A simple solution is to calculate the average light intensity in each position and find the uh, position with the maximum value, but ambient light fluctuation can, can lead to decoding errors because those light passes are very sparse, are very short and distant from one another. Suppose this is the ambient light change over time and the transmitted light signal is added on top of it, if we still compute the average light intensity in each position, we will find the wrong position and decode the data incorrectly. To solve this problem, we use an edge detection method. We first compute the first order derivative of the light intensity using a Gaussian derivative filter, and then we find the slot maximum. And in this way, we can filter out the slow ambient light fluctuation. The last component of dark light is to deal with multiple dark light transmitters. Although light beams, is, uh, although light beams are directional, a receiver can still see multiple transmitters, and the light passes at a receiver can easily interfere with one another and can easily mess up with the decoding. The receiver needs to identify which LED a light pulse belongs to. And here is our solution. We leverage the fact that different LEDs have their own sets of time slots that are very unlikely to be perfectly aligned so for a light pulse, we can compare its rise edge to the starting points of time slots of an LED, and then to determine if that pulse belongs to that LED. And here is a simple example. We mark the time slots of two LEDs in different colors, and they are not aligned. And with the set of received uh, light pulses, we first detect the rise edges and then we compare their position to the time slots of each LED. And for the LED1, we can see that these are the light pulses belong to LED1. And then we can do the same for LED2 and find the light pulses belong to LED2. So after the classification, we can do the decoding for individual LED easily. If the LEDs are synchronized, we can arrange the time slots so that they are not aligned. If the LEDs are unsynchronized, it's possible that the, two, the time slots of two LEDs are too close to distinguish. And in the paper, we analyzed the probability of that kind of collision. We call it slot collision. And please refer to our detail for detail. Uh, please refer to our paper for detail. We, impl we implement our design using off-the-shelf LD and low-cost photodiode. We build a transmitter and a receiver board using general purpose PCB, and we evaluate our prototype in both user perception and system performance. 
Here are the results for our user perception study. We invited 20 user uh, participants. Their ages range from 22 to 60. And there are two viewing scenarios. The first one is direct viewing, where the participants look up and stare at, stare at the LED. And second is indirect viewing, where the users look around the environment without staring at the LED. And in each scenario, we randomly set the LED, light, LED mode to dark light mode or real light off mode. And then we asked, without telling the participants the current mode, and then we asked the user if they think the LED is real off. So we, then we repeat the experiment and compute the per percentage of how likely the user think the LED is off. And the higher the percentage, and more likely the user think the LED is real off. And here are the results for three different light conditions, a noon, twilight, and night, night. And we have three observations. First, even for real light off, the percentage is not 100. This is, of course, when it's hard to distinguish real light off and dark light, participants will make mistake in their guess. And second, for indirect viewing, people can hardly distinguish dark light and the real light off. This is because the illuminance generated by dark light is extremely low, which is only 0.06 lux, which is even lower than the moonlight. And third, people, do, people can distinguish the difference between dark light and the real light off when they stare at the LED in a very dark environment. This is because our human eyes are very sensitive to light in the dark. And next, we test our system, our system link performance. And first, we measure the throughput. The x-axis is the distance from the transmitter to the receiver, and the y-axis is the throughput, which is the number of bits correctly received per second. And from the result, we can see that our dark light prototype can support 1.6 kilobits per second up to a distance of 1.8 meters. We extended the communication range from 1.3 meters to 1.8 meters since the camera ready because we, uh, we improved the circuit design and reduced the circuit noise. We repeated the experiment in different ambient light conditions, day, night, with and without fluorescent light. And we noticed negligible difference which means that our system is resistant to ambient light interference. And next, I'll show you the power performance of dark light. Here, I'm going to plot the LED front-end power for both dark light and normal VLC. And we can see that dark light consumes orders of magnitude lower energy than normal VLC. Finally, we test how dark light works when there are multiple dark light transmitters. And we place 20 LEDs in a rectangle area of, air of 0 0.06 square meters to emulate a dense LED deployment. And each time we turn on several of them and use one receiver to decode data from all of them. And the x-axis is the number of LEDs and the y-axis is the network throughput. And we plot the results for two settings. The first one is synchronized LEDs, which we emulate the ceiling LEDs that are centralized controlled. And the second one is unsynchronized. We emulate the peer-to-peer -peer communication on like smart devices. And from the result, we can see that the network throughput grows almost linearly with the number of LEDs for synchronized setting. And for unsynchronized, the network throughput drops a little because of slot collision. But uh, overall, the, our system, the network throughput scales well with the LED, in de uh, LED density. Next, I will conclude my talk with future work. Currently, the data rate of dark light is mainly limited by the low-end LEDs and photodiodes, so we, we plan to 
examine high-end LEDs and photodiodes, and also try more sophisticated circuit design to, to generate even shorter light passes. And second, it's possible to improve the dark light's energy efficiency by replacing the power-hungry USRP with a low-cost analog-to-digital converter, and also implement the encoding and decoding using ASIC design. And finally, by pushing light to its limits, dark light enables a lot of interesting applications. And we are interested in, uh, we are interested in applications like visible light sensing in the dark, and we believe there are many more applications yet to come. And that's all I have. And by the way, I will give a demo in this afternoon, and you are very welcome to, co uh, you are very welcome to come by. And I'm happy to take any questions, and may the force be with you. Thank you.